gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. May you filter out all the foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is Ruth Part 7. I find it interesting when I think about how that all of the characters that we see in this story that to consider, just to stop for a moment and just consider how that God designed not only designed their circumstances, but he created these individuals. He set them apart from uh, their mother's womb. They were born at a time of his will, his choosing. They were born into the environment in which they were born into. They were led through and carried through the, the just the right circumstances for everything to take place that occurred to meet one another as they did to have the relationships with one another that they did, to be of the same, of the, of the ages uh, in which they were, that God created the very field that Boaz owned, that he arranged the meeting between Boaz and Ruth the way that he did, that he allowed uh, the circumstances to develop in such a way as to where that it would come to illustrate one of what I believe is the greatest stories, true accounts, of that illustrates through symbolism some marvelous, amazing symbolism the redemption of Israel, the redemption of the body of Christ, the marriage of the body of Christ, how that. Uh, God loves us, directs us, takes us through trials and circumstances which turn out to be for our good, that uh, He works all things according to the counsel of His own will. I mean, any number of things could, could have gone wrong to where that God would have uh, not been able to give us the, the types and the story that, and the way that He did. I guess that's what I just want you to take take a moment just to stop and consider just how mighty, almighty our God is, the almighty God, the creator of, of the heavens, the one who hung the stars in the sky. He didn't just stumble upon this experience and he didn't just look at the lives of these individuals and, and say, well, that's interesting, They their, their lives, their their actions and everything are, are just lined up so so perfectly that I'll take and I'll use that as an illustration to describe my relationship with my people. You know, just, just by happenstance that all of this sort of, you know, lined up in such a way as to where that I can, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll choose to take that and I'll, I'll make a story out of it. And my question to you would be is is not does does God not do the same thing in our lives I've mentioned to you how I believe it's it's perfectly acceptable to draw any spiritual lessons that you can from the text as long as they're in agreement with the word of God I believe the Lord is teaching us primarily about the person and the work of Christ and I see many cases in which ministers draw a lesson from the text which is, has virtually nothing to do with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I don't believe this book is a textbook on how that you invest your money, that you live your lives, or raise your, your kids, or anything else. It is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, His person, His work, and the spiritual lessons that we should draw from the text have to do with the person and the work of Christ. I believe we were somewhere around verse 14 of chapter 3. Ruth's been uh, prompted by Naomi, I believe Naomi, to be at least a type of the nation Israel, 
and, and God's dealings with Israel, as well as the type of the Holy Spirit, because uh, Ruth is directed to Boaz by Naomi. And we saw in a previous study that, that Ruth proposed. She told Boaz that she was not only uh, uh, a marriageable individual, but that uh, he was to cast the corner of his skirt over her. That is a beautiful Hebrew idiom that Ruth is asking Boaz to take over her protection, her provision, her supply, all of her needs. It is a wonderful picture of what God has done for us. You know, we know that we're told to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and God will take care of all the, all the rest. To take no thought about what we'll eat or, or what we'll drink or, or wherewithal you shall be clothed, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. That's what Ruth is saying. I want all of my needs covered, all of my protection, all of my supply. And I believe it also includes His love. It's a beautiful picture of God providing entirely and totally for us. He's agreed to do that. Do we trust Him concerning that? So he told her to stay there until the morning. And in the 14th verse, she slept at his feet until morning. She's perfectly satisfied, perfectly content with his commitment to her. And I believe that that is a beautiful picture of those whom God has redeemed. I'm going to try to expand on this picture just a bit as we go on in the study. The interesting thing in the book of Ruth is that at the end of the chapter, uh, end of chapter 3, and whoever the people are that, that make the, the chapter divisions, I'm, I think they did a really good job here. Sometimes they don't. They don't seem to do the best job. But they seem to, to have done a, a really good job here. Although I happen to think God d directed in that as well, is in the text. But be that as, as it may, they, they did a good job here because Ruth and Naomi completely drop out in chapter 4. They're gone. And that, I believe, is a beautiful illustration. We'll look at that in, in just a moment. She rested there. Imagine how excited this, that Ruth must have been. And yet the indication is that she laid there, she slept in peace and tranquility at his feet until morning. Then she rose up before anybody else could know her. Again, a, a beautiful illustration of the intimate relationship between us and the Lord an intimate relationship that's, that's just between you and Him. And He said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also, He said, Bring the veil that you have with you and, uh, and hold it. She held it. He measured out six measures of barley. The Hebrew says six barleys and laid it on her. And she went into the city. Now, I believe the picture is that he's undertaken her supply. I don't know how much barley that was. I have no idea how much it was, and I believe that's done on purpose by the Holy Spirit. Because your needs may not be my needs, and my needs may not be your needs. I think the Hebrew is very, very definite in obscuring how much that that, that was. Well, what we can say is that it was what Ruth and Naomi needed. That's how much it was. So Boaz, she puts it on her because he wasn't going to let her go home empty. So I think we have a, a beautiful type here as well, that he's not only agreed to take care of her, but here's the provision at this moment. This is what she needs. It may not be what she wants, but at this moment it's what she needs. And that's always true between God and His people. And I think it's a beautiful type of the provision that He provides. Then she, she goes to her mother-in-law. She came to her mother-in-law, and her mother-in-law greeted her. My Bible says, Who art thou? As, as though she he didn't have any idea who it was. That's, that's kind of how it sounds. And some have suggested that it, it was so dark that she didn't recognize her. I don't think the text says that. I believe that is a Hebrew greeting that says, How are things with you? You know, that might be a literal translation. How's it going, I guess, is what we'd say today. 
how are things my daughter? And it's ridiculous to, to, to say that she didn't recognize her in the dark, but she called her my daughter. I think it's a, a Hebrew idiom. How are things or how's it going with you, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for. Well, we have a comforter, the Holy Spirit. God has made great promises for us and He's told us of our provision. He's promised us victory and assurance, peace and rest and joy. If you watched my last video on John 17, the, the seven or the eight assurances there, we see that there as well. And He's given us a down payment of that. He's given us an earnest payment that says, here it is so that you know what I've done. And that's the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that communion between us and the Holy Spirit is typified in verse 16. And He said to me, do not go home empty to thy mother-in-law. Now, if Naomi is also a type of Israel, her her, which I believe she is, her complaint in chapter 1 it was that she had gone out full and come back empty. And the exact expression is used here where Boaz says to Ruth, don't go back empty. Naomi is not empty. Israel, folks, is not forsaken. God has not forsaken His people Israel. Now we know that from Romans chapter 9. We know that God has not cast off Israel. The Holy Spirit is, has Paul say, may it never be, God forbid it, God has not cast off Israel. He set them aside while the Gentiles are grafted in, but they've not been cast off. And the provision that's given to Ruth is also given to Israel. As, as we look at the Word of God and what he's, God has programmed ahead, you know, the great missionary effort of all history is Israel going to all the nations of the world. Hasn't happened yet. In fact, it won't happen until, until the body of Christ has been removed. You know, there's a number of people preaching that Jesus Christ can't return until every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue has been reached. But, but every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue are to be reached by Israel, not by missionaries of the body of Christ. We don't have that mission, but Israel, they're going to do the greatest missionary effort of all history after we're gone. And so they're not going to be empty. And there is communion between Ruth and her mother-in-law. So then, then her mother-in-law said, sit still my daughter until thou know how the matter will fall for the man will not be in rest until, until he has finished the thing this day. Don't do anything, my daughter, until you know, Exper until you know experientially how the matter will turn out. For the man will not be in rest until he finished the thing this day. God declares in Proverbs 16, 33, that the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. The whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Ruth has to do nothing. And it's astounding to me how much preaching and how much literature is put out on what we ought to do. You know, it's just, it's do, 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 do. And it isn't rest. You know, and I've mentioned this a number of times. I, it, there, in no way do I want to demean Christian service. Not at all. But the service that's biblical is the service of love. It's, it's out of love, not fear. We do what we do for the Lord because we love Him. We need do nothing as far as our assurance and our relationship is concerned. When Christ appeared to the disciples after His resurrection from the dead, I, I would have rebuked... I, I, I'd have probably scolded them. I would have probably rebuked them for their lack of faith and trust. But, but, but His words were peace. Peace be unto you. Do nothing. And then and Naomi and Ruth will disappear from the narrative. There's no synergism in, in the process of what we're about to see in chapter 4. 
Ruth has nothing to do with the legal proceedings which are about to take place. Take note of that fact. Sit here, do nothing, until you have the knowledge in experience of just how things turn out, and they all turn out exactly as God had determined. And so we go into chapter 4. Then Boaz went up. Now, Boaz had been sleeping. It had been night, and now he goes up. I think you have a picture of the resurrection of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and what was involved in that death, burial, and resurrection. Was it not the union of those who were his own with him? We died with him, we were buried with him, and we were raised with him. Ruth is now in an attitude of rest. Boaz went up to the gate and sat down. He sat down. Okay? Jesus Christ rose from the dead and He sat down at the right hand of, of the Majesty on high. And what is He doing up there? He's dealing with, you know, is He, is he, is he working on the election of 2020 or Iran or Russia or China? or No, no. What is He doing? What's He doing? He's dealing with that which pertains to us. That's what he's doing. There is no Ruth. There's no Naomi. And I think all of this is, is all of this stuff really happened. Okay, but that isn't the purpose of the book. This is not a history book. It is a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I believe Boaz to be that type of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ was God Almighty who became incarnate in human flesh and He was made sin in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, which we were. And I believe the picture of Boaz going up is a picture of the resurrection of our Lord. And where does He go? He sits in court. That's the picture that we have in verse 1 of chapter 4. He went up to the gate. That's where legal proceedings took place in the cities because it was the, the easiest place, the most convenient place for this to happen. He went up and he sat down in the gate just as Christ ascended, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And behold, the kinsman, the kinsman of whom Boaz knew, came by. And I sat there and I puzzled about uh, the word behold. I don't know why it's there. I believe it, it, it could be there at picturing the fact that God is handling this. This kinsman of whom Boaz knew came by. He said, Ho, such a one. Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and he sat down. And we've got a well of a verse. The problem is we don't have a good enough teacher to tell us all that's involved in this verse. I'm going to suggest, first of all, we don't have any Ruth, and we don't have any Naomi. We have legal proceedings. What's going on here at this, at this moment are legal proceedings, and Boaz has sat down in court. He gets ten men, and he tells them in verse 2 to sit down for open court. So what I now have is a legal proceeding with Boaz and the other kinsmen sitting in open court. I have to see that near kinsman as the law. I've gone through all the possibilities. You know, is it Satan? Is it the law? Is it the flesh? Is, is it the Father? When you, when you kind of go through all that and you look at the text and you see, uh, you know, everything that took place and you kind of keep score, you have to, by process of elimination... You, you, at least in my case, I was left with it being the law. Which didn't surprise me at all. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And He came after Moses. So, I have to see that near kinsman is the law. Satan and the Father don't work from a theological standpoint. I'll put a, uh, I'll put a chart up here uh, I hope you see it. 
on the screen that I made that might help you understand my position on this. So we know the law was given to Israel, of which Naomi is a type. The law was never given to the church. Surely Boaz knows his name, but his name is not revealed. God did not reveal to us his name. We see no human name associated with what, what I'm suggesting, what I believe is the law, which defines the character and the holiness of God. Yet it is absolutely inconceivable that Boaz wouldn't know his name. And yet he, he doesn't use his name. He uses an interesting Hebrew phrase. If you look at it in the Hebrew, it's poloni alimony, or al, not alimony, poloni almoni. So whoever the nearer kinsman is, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to reveal any specific name. And that, to me, adds another vote to the law. You've got to decide that for yourself. Uh, I'm just telling you what I think. And so turn aside and sit down, and he did. In fact, that's a, that's a command in the Hebrew. He was commanded to, to sit down, and he did. So whoever so-and-so was, uh, whoever he, he is, this kinsman is is in this particular context, he seems to yield to Boaz, which could easily be a vote for the law. And what he does is he immediately turns around and he sits down. Boaz takes 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here, and they sat down. There, there are 10 laws in the commandments. So we have a, we have a legally constituted uh, quorum to bear testimony to what he's about to say. And he says to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi that has come out of the country of Moab sold a parcel of the land, which was our brother Elimelech's. The word translated uh, brother indicates that they were near relatives. I don't believe that they were actual brothers. In the third verse, the word seller this is interesting, and it kind of confused me a bit. The word seller is actually in the perfect tense. The straightforward translation would be, she's already sold it. Now let that sink in for a moment. You know, scholars differ on how the perfect is to be translated, and, and I'm, not, I'm not an expert in Hebrew, but I, but I happen to think that the normal perfect tense is, here is correct. Not because I'm an expert on Hebrew grammar, but I think in the, in the case of Naomi and Ruth, outside of the redemption that is in Christ, it's a done transaction. Remember that they, they left their land where they belonged, and they went into a land that God had cursed. Naomi has returned to the land, but believes that she has returned empty. There's no hope. And something has to be done about it. So I think that the perfect is, is perfectly proper here. When you look at the theology in Ruth's case and Naomi and, and Israel's case, it is a done transaction without Christ. So I thought to advise you, my Bible says, uh, advertise. I don't know what translation you're using. My Bible says advertise. I'm not sure whether you know this or, or, or not, near kinsman, whatever his name is. I thought I ought to let you know, buy it before the elders. Okay, we have a legal proceeding here. The word buy is the same one that's used a bit later on in the verse where he says he's going to buy it. And Boaz says if he, do, if he does that, he's got to buy Ruth, which, which, again, I don't believe the law can do. And I think that scene is a beautiful picture of the restoration of Israel to the land, as well as Christ redeeming us, His body, the church, where that both have to be done. Now, the law is not going to get them the land. The flesh isn't going to get them the land. And I think both of those apply here. Satan's 
is going to do everything in the world to see that they not get the land. The dispute is over the land. So I believe this is a beautiful picture of the solution of that dispute. Israel is going to be restored to the land because of the finished work of Christ, whom I believe is typed here by Boaz. The interesting thing is that in the ultimate end, we who have counted Israel as a friend will also turn against Israel, and it's going to be God who defends Israel, nobody else. Just as Boaz is defending uh, uh, or the, the near kinsman is defending the inheritance here and the law is unwilling to proceed with that entire redemption because coupled to the land Naomi is the body of Christ Ruth amazing it's, it's, I'm just absolutely astounded folks at how God designed, ordained created, deigned uh, willed, directed, all of this. What do, you, what do you think that he's doing in our lives? Oh, but Steve, th these people were, you know, I know they, were, they were specially chosen, set aside by God. You know, they were, they were heroes of the faith. They were unique individuals. We're not that. You know, God's not working in our life that way. And I beg to differ. I think that he's working in your life in just a, as, as dramatic a way as he did in theirs. That's what I believe. So I want you, before the elders, before this duly constituted court, to buy that land of Naomi to redeem it because you're a redeemer. And if thou wilt not redeem it, I will. If you'll perform the function of a kinsman redeemer, then do it. If you, if, if, if you'll not be the kinsman redeemer, then tell me so I can know it. For there is none to redeem it, and I am after you, says Boaz. I am after you. And we know that Christ follows the law. He came to fulfill the law. He does what the law could not do, in that the law was weak through the flesh. God did what the law could not do in sending Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh, to redeem them that were under the law. And that, of course, m makes the best picture here. And bear in mind that the flesh couldn't do it either. Law, flesh, you can't speak of one really without speaking of the other. And he said, I'll do it. Now that bothers a lot of people. Why should the law say, I'll, I'll do it? You know, we can't charge the law of God with lying which is why I believe this near kinsman represents the law and the flesh. I believe a fair, impartial court would give the land to Israel today, which I don't think we have. There's, there is no the United Nations is, is not fair and impartial. I think, but I think if, if they took it, this matter to court, I think that Israel would be granted the land. I believe that for a fact. Legally. I'm, I'm talking legally. Legally, Israel would be granted the land. If I could argue for the law, I could, I could say the law could give the land to Israel. It could provide Naomi with her proper land. It was hers. It belonged to her. Uh, or belonged to her husband. And then came to belong to her. As far as the law is concerned, the land could be given to Israel. But... As far as the flesh is concerned, the law cannot redeem Ruth. Simply put, Boaz, Christ, fulfilled this near kinsman, you know, which if you look at him as the law, which as it turns out, did not redeem either Naomi or Ruth, Israel or the church, it had an inheritance all its own. That's the law did. And the only inheritance, the uh, law could have had, was Christ who fulfilled it, who in fact embodies it. He embod Christ embodies the law. 
the law was willing to redeem Israel, Naomi, but it couldn't. It couldn't because the flesh was weak. Now that's how I'm looking at this. Uh, I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying anything uh, here is, is absolute fact. I'm just giving you my, my take on all this. And you don't have to agree with any anything that's said. I've never asked anyone to agree with any of this. But I'm just, I'm, hopefully this helps you think more about the text. It helps you think more about the book of Ruth. And uh, you may, the Holy Spirit may guide you and give you some ideas that He never gave me. And I'd love it if you'd share those with me. The law, folks, was not weak. It was the flesh that was weak and unable to redeem by means of the law. I believe this to be theologically consistent as far as this, the picture here is concerned. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, His person, His work, and the spiritual lessons that we should draw from the text have to do with just that, with the person and the work of Christ in your life and what that means and how that you can rest in Him. Oh, dearly beloved, I hope that you have come to, at least at by this point, I, I hope that you have come to receive in your own personal life the same exact blessings that, that, that God gave Naomi and Ruth in our present text. And that brings us to verse 6 of chapter 4, which is where I'll, I'll uh, probably pick up next time. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I, I, I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate all of your comments, your, particularly your prayers for the direction of this ministry. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Until next time, this is Steve. Rest in Him. Thanks for watching.